Let me introduce David Kodria first. David Kodria, this is a heartbreaking hour. It, it certainly is, Mark, and I think as uh, you know, you're, you're a parent, I'm a parent, and when you start to realize uh, what uh, the next guest has been forced to go through, the ordeal he's gone through and is still going through, I always come back to, you know, what's what's the main purpose of government? It's right there in the preamble to secure the blessings of liberty. Right. And New Jersey certainly did not do any favors to Brian Aiken, who uh, basically he was arrested while he was transporting locked up and unloaded guns that had been legally purchased in Colorado. He was transporting them from one residence to another. People who followed the story know that for that violation, they, they sentenced him to seven years. Governor Christie, through a lot of public outrage, commuted the man's sentence, but it didn't expunge the conviction, so he's still prohibited from owning firearms. And the real heartbreaker, and and this is what really wrenched me, is that for the past four years, he hasn't even been allowed to see his son right. because the family court judge decided that, well, you know what, we have this uh, Graves Act in New Jersey, and it talks about illegal possession of firearms, and, and basically it makes us treat people as if they were violent criminals. And, and I heard that, and it was just, I, I couldn't believe the man has not seen his son for four years. And I think it's just so important that people learn this man's story and then find out what he's trying to do to get his son back. Yeah, I would like to point out also that uh, his attorney, Evan Knappen, was on this show when America became aware of this. We brought this to our listeners' attention across the country when this story first broke, David, if you recall. Right. I Evan was Knappen about came it on. as well, Mark. And at that time, our next guest, Brian Aiken, was in a New Jersey prison. And let's go ahead and introduce Brian now. Brian, welcome to the show. I'm honored to have you here. Thank you for joining Armed American Radio. I want the world to hear your story. People need to understand what's happening out there, and I don't think anybody can tell it better than you, Brian. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me on the show. Unfortunately, I didn't get to hear the last time that, that you guys talked about my case because I was in prison. America, listen to what you just heard. Brian, you couldn't come on the show last time. Why? Because I was in prison. Charged with what? Three different three different charges. Illegal possession of firearms, illegal possession of high-capacity magazines, and illegal possession of hollow point ammunition. All right, and this is very, very relevant, relevant David Codria, to what's happening now. We Because, ladies and gentlemen, we have a slew of new gun control, gun safety acts. New York, Albany. The SAFE Act. Please pay very careful attention to this. You came from Colorado to New Jersey, and of course those laws in Colorado have changed radically. David, isn't this incredibly relevant now with these new gun control laws, what we're hearing or getting ready to hear? Look, look, look at the people who are good, peaceable people who are being made criminals by bureaucratic edict. And, and it just, it's outrageous. It's, it's just despicable. Nothing short of legislative evil. Brian, would you tell America your story? Absolutely. Well, I was I was moving from Colorado to New Jersey to be closer to my son. My wife and I were separating. I was only about seven months outside of college, and you know I had a job, I had a house, I had a mortgage, um, all the you know responsible young adult things you would expect you know a, co- a young college graduate to have, and I was moving from my parents' house in South Jersey that I had just flown to, and TSA had cleared me to have the firearms and the ammunition on the plane. It was in checked luggage. I was moving from Mount Laurel to, to Hoboken when I was pulled over. And, that, and that, that's, that's a long part of the story as well. Um, my mom and, and, uh, and I were talking because my ex-wife had canceled visitation with my son for four weeks in a, in a row, and I had I'd missed visitation for Christmas, and it was January 2nd, and I had visitation coming up again in a few days. She sent me a text message letting me know that she was canceling it again. And there was a court order saying that, that I had, you know, guaranteed parenting time. And I moved 3,000 miles across the country just to be closer to my son. And I, I had found a new job in New York City. I had changed, you know, my entire life. In addition to paying for the house, I was also paying for rent in Hoboken. And it was uh, it was upsetting. And I told my mom, I don't know what the point in being here is if I can't see my son. After I had finished packing my car and started driving up to Hoboken, and my mom dialed 911 and immediately hung up the phone. And the, the police came out for what they refer to as an abandoned 911 call. And when they got to my mom's house, they, they wanted to know what had happened. And 
she explained that, oh, you know, I was, I was talking to my son, and, and he was pretty upset because he hasn't been able to see his son in over a month, and he, and he just moved here. She works for the Burlington County Family Support Organization. This is what she does all the time. She's trained to, you know, look for, look for signals and to, to call the police whenever she has, like, any questions or concerns. Usually she would talk to them, but in my case, she realized, I, I know my son. I know he's not suicidal. Like, I'm, I'm overthinking this, and she hung up the phone before, before they picked up. But that, by then it was too late because the, the state had already found their way in, into my life. So they were there to help you. Is that what they would say? Oh, man, I wish. Yeah, right? I, because, honestly, at the time, I could have used some help. Maybe I could have talked to somebody, and and they could have, you know, found me some sort of free legal aid or, or, or something that, that, could have, that could have helped. Because it's a lot of money to, to go through a custody battle. And then when it got to the point where I was having to come up with money to fight these criminal charges, it was just completely impossible for right, well, what let's let's back up for just a second after after they found your they found their in based on yeah. the conversation with with your mother's what you're referring to correct brian yeah and and then they called me uh using her cell phone and they said they wanted me to come back to, to my parents house and they wanted to check me for bruises to make sure that i hadn't been assaulted i i said well you know i haven't been assaulted like i don't have any bruises my mom assaulted by who your mother uh, yeah, that was the insinuation. I mean, this, is, this is just a very weird request. I don't know why you would call me. Like, my mom is the most peaceful, nice person on the planet. She would never hurt me or anybody else. And they're like, well, we also want to make sure that you're not suicidal. And I was like, well, I'm not suicidal. I'm moving in. I Like, it's Friday. I've got work on Monday. I've got a lot of things to do. And driving all the way back to Mount Laurel isn't on my list. Do I have to come back? Am I legally obligated to come back? The police officer said, no, you're not legal. We would like you to come back, but you're not legally obligated to. I said, okay, well, you know, thank you. Uh, I'm, if I'm not legally obligated to come back, I'm, I'm not going to. And we got off the phone. And about a minute later, she called back and said, I've issued a, a statewide general alert, and all of the jurisdictions in New Jersey are looking out for you. They're looking out for the make and model of your car. And if they find you, they're going to take you in, impound your car, and bring you back down here. So you can pretty much do this the easy way or the hard way. Oh, my God. My blood's boiling. And I, Brian, I've got an attorney sitting in the studio with me. I wish you could see the look on his face. Is the hair on your neck rising yet? I'm thinking the old, you know, my heritage is Transylvanian. And uh, basically, you never invite the vampire to cross your threshold and he can't come in. And isn't that a shame that we have to say that? about uh, police who are supposed to be there to help us. It's frightening. What I'm hearing is frightening, and we're going to hear more of it, and we're going to go into detail from Brian Aiken, who was convicted of a crime and sentenced to seven years in prison. This segment of Armed American Radio is being brought to you by the Gun Owners of America, America's no-compromise gun lobby. Become a member today. Visit gunowners.org. Join them, folks. I did. Welcome back. Welcome back, indeed, to the Crossbreed Holster Studios. I'm Mark Walters, filling your prescription for freedom across America. And many of you across the country, listeners in many cities in Colorado, listeners in Connecticut, listeners in New York. Listeners in Maryland, pay very careful attention to what you're hearing here. One of this young man's charges, my guest Brian Aiken, one of his charges was in violation of high-capacity ammunition magazines, otherwise known across the rest of free America as standard-capacity magazines, which your Democrat governors have convinced you and the media are considered high-capacity magazines. You can be charged with the same thing. I want you to pay very careful attention to what's happening here. Elections have consequences, and what you're getting ready to hear is incredibly disturbing. David Codria, welcome back. You know, kind of funny, if you're getting it on a government procurement, it's a personal defense capacity magazine. Ah, isn't that right? Isn't that right? Yes, that's correct. So government capacity, you mean law enforcement? You know, it's like uh, patrol rifles versus assault rifles, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just a different name depending on whose hands it's in? Mm Mm-hmm. 
Ed Stone in the studio with me. Not only are you an attorney, but you are also a 12-year law enforcement officer. That's correct. Before I was a lawyer, I was a police officer. Yeah. All right. So, Brian, we've got some expertise in this room. I want you to continue, if you would, your story in your own words, and I'm just going to let you have the mic. Uh, you, your mother called. They issued a basically a, a bolo, be on the lookout, statewide alert for you, correct? That's exactly what happened. I mean, it wasn't really much of a choice. Either I'm essentially on the run from the law, and I don't know what that means. I don't know what the consequences are. Um, They told me that I wasn't being charged with a crime and that I didn't have to return, and then all of a sudden I'm told that if I don't return, that I'm essentially going to be taken into custody and have my car impounded in it. It's just just crazy to me. And in hindsight, you know, with with several years to to reflect on this, I should have just kept on driving, but I didn't. The intimidation tactics worked, and I turned around and I came back, and that that was my biggest mistake. Well, that's because you're a law-abiding citizen. Law-abiding citizens fear the law, respect the law, and you did, I think, what most law-abiding people would do in that nobody wants to get in trouble when you're a law-abiding citizen. If you would, continue. So you turned around and you went, you went back. Your parents must have been beside themselves at this point. Oh, yeah. They, they were then, and, uh, I mean, they still are now. I got back to my parents' house. I talked to the police officers for probably about an hour before they, they asked if they could search my car. It wouldn't be until about three and a half hours after they started questioning me that they would even Mirandize me, but that's, that's a whole other story. So after about an hour of me sitting on the driveway and not being free to leave, they finally asked for my consent to search the car. And I, I asked them if that's completely necessary. You know, they were satisfied that I wasn't suicidal. They were satisfied that, uh, you know, there hadn't been any sort of violence or anything like that. So I asked, we just skip that? And since, you know, you don't think I'm suicidal and you don't think that there's been any any crime or anything, can I just go home now. It's, it's getting late. I'd really like to just go home. Brian, I'm going to stop you right there. Ed Stone wants to jump in. Ed, go ahead. I just wanted to ask you, Brian, my recollection of this, uh, having read about it, this is the first time we've talked, is that you uh, believed at the time you hadn't done anything wrong. Didn't you seek out some advice from law enforcement about how to transport these weapons? I did. I did. My uh, And it, it's hard to keep track of everything because so much has happened. But my my uncle was uh, a Philadelphia police officer for 23 years and taught how to use a handgun at the Philadelphia Police Academy. And before I moved from my parents' house up to Hoboken, I called him and I said, what should I do? And he said, you know what, I'm out of Philadelphia. You should call the New Jersey State Police Barracks. They're going to have a detective who's in charge of firearms. So I called and I I was sent to a a detective down in Belmar, out of the Belmar Barracks, and he told me exactly how to move my, my handguns. It pretty much comes down to if you look at the statute, if you look at the exemption for how your handguns are supposed to be transported from one house to another, locked and unloaded in the trunk of a car, it's a copy and paste job straight from the statute into the police report. Every, like everything that I did was a, like a verb, verbatim straight from, straight from the statute. I couldn't have been more on the books than than what I was doing. So you followed the law enforcement instructions on everything from how to pack your weapons to move them to uh, coming back to your mother's house. Exactly. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> let, let, let me push this conversation forward. You gave them you gave them permission to search your car at that point. Again, intimidation factor, I'm going to guess. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it, it was just one thing after another. So at, at this point, they said, well, we're convinced you're not suicidal, but if you don't let us search the car, uh, and at that point I asked, well, you know, I, I don't really want you to, and I'm thinking in the back of my head, this is just going to be a nightmare. Like, as, as soon as they come across my guns and my ammunition, even though they're illegal and I can prove that everything that I'm doing is on the books, New Jersey has a reputation, and oh, yeah. it's, just, it's just going to be a nightmare. So I'm trying to avoid that as, as politely as possible. Uh, and I, I bring up, you know, I'm like, oh, well, you know, like, like wouldn't a judge have to sign a warrant in order to do a search? And they're like, no, no, you can just sign this consent form. Uh, and I was like, yeah, but, like, you know, isn't a warrant necessary? And they're like, well, we could get a warrant, but, you know, that would take a while. And, you know, we would have to send you to a psychiatric hospital for a 72-hour hold, at which point we would impound your car. And when your car is impounded, we would have to take an inventory of all of the possessions inside of the car. So we would search it anyway while, while you're in a psychiatric hospital. So 
so they're they're giving me this easy way or hard way option again. I was like, well, that just that just sounds ridiculous. Like you guys don't think that I'm a threat to myself or anyone else. Why, I mean, why would you do that? And I was like, well, because we really want to search. You know, given given the option of of missing work on Monday, and you know, and staying in a, a psychiatric hospital, or just having them search my car and explaining, you know, that I talked to the New Jersey State Police. Showing them the statutes and, and, and explaining that everything's above water, I chose I chose signing the consent form, and it took them about two hours to search my car because it was it was packed from floor to ceiling with absolutely everything that I owned. Yeah, this this is just a horror story nightmare that they imposed on this man. And can you imagine? Do what we say and waive your Fourth Amendment rights, or suffer a psychiatric hospital. Right in your face. When we come back, Brian's going to continue the story and tell us what happened as he went through the system. Brian Aiken, welcome back to the show. It's uh, very disturbing to hear what we're hearing. We're talking about this off air. And uh, I'd like to welcome you back, and then Ed Stone and David Codry as well. Brian, welcome back. Wow. Like I said when we left the, the last break, what we're getting ready to hear now I think is the worst part of this because it's everybody's nightmare. It's every law-abiding citizen's nightmare. And I think he, I think he really hit it, Mark, by saying "law-abiding citizen," because here we have a guy trying to do everything right. This is a guy that is going to move mountains to be with his son. This is a guy that calls in advance to find out what the laws are so that he can be in compliance, and to portray him as somehow being unfit to have a gun over any issue like this. Look at the ordeal he's been through. Brian, let's continue. They've searched your car. They have found your firearms in the car, packaged properly, as you were told, by the New Jersey State Police. And let me ask you quickly, was this the New Jersey State Police? I wish it was, because I'm fairly sure what happened would not have happened if it was. Instead, it was uh, it was the Merrill uh, Police. It was a local jurisdiction. And when they found the guns, they didn't disbelieve me that those laws existed and, and that those were the exemptions. But they didn't believe me either, and they didn't feel like checking. Uh, they felt like just having a judge sort it out. So they arrested you on the spot? They did, for a charge that didn't exist. The The arrest that reads on my... The charge that, that reads on my original arrest record is illegal possession of unregistered firearms. And there is no registration law in New Jersey. But when they asked me, are they, you know, are they registered? And I tried to explain to them that, you know, there's no legal requirement to register firearms in New Jersey. That seemed like a surprise to them. They had no idea that that was the law. And I think we should probably at. point out at this point, too, that you were still a Colorado resident, weren't you? You had a Colorado driver's license at the time? I did, yeah. Okay. Ed, that would have made him clearly, by law, a Colorado resident. Isn't that correct? That's hard to say. That's you don't different know what New Jersey, different right. states. Okay. All right, so you were arrested, you were handcuffed, and uh, tell us about the nightmare that ensued. Oh, well, it was a Friday, so my parents weren't able to come and bail me out because it was a Friday night and it was a weekend. So I spent the weekend in prison. I had to go to county. And uh, finally, Monday, uh, they were able to come and bail me out. And uh, I just, you know, went forward trying trying to live my life, trying to find a lawyer who could take care of this, and, uh, and, and I did. I retained a lawyer and let him know, you know, these are the charges and, uh, you know, this is what I'm up against, and here are the statutes. You know, this is this is who I talked to at the state police, and this is all, a list of all the exemptions, and here are the specific ones that protect what I was doing. And uh, I, I sort of realized he was not the lawyer to go with when, when he was insulted by the fact that I was showing him what the laws were. He eventually moved to be relieved as counsel because I, I refused to take a plea deal. I, I tried my, my hardest to keep him from, from leaving me, and we had reached an agreement where I paid him a fixed rate, and that fixed rate was for all of the pretrial hearings as well as for taking me through trial. And he knew that I had no intention from the very beginning of taking a plea deal. But when more than a half dozen plea offers came in and I kept on refusing them. I could see he was getting more and more irritated by me. And uh, he filed the motion to be relieved as counsel, and I found myself completely alone facing the state. That's when I took my case public. I, before that, I just wanted to keep quiet and have this go away. I didn't want it to affect my custody. I didn't want it to affect my career. But I, I had to go to the public and ask for the public's help. How many charges? Three in total. How many felonies? All three of them. 
All three were felonies, no misdemeanors. Okay, this is this is every law-abiding citizen's nightmare, David Godria. Every law-abiding citizen's nightmare. And and here's the thing: being law-abiding citizens, we're not used to rubbing elbows with uh, what Brian had to go through when they stuck him in the slammer over the weekend. All right, let's move forward. In the essence of time, you went through the process. You went to court about how much how, how much time had had elapsed, and you were convicted. Yeah, it was about a year and a half uh, of motions to dismiss based upon the fact that I'd broken no laws, motions to suppress the evidence uh, based on violations of my Fourth Amendment rights, all of which the judge didn't really seem to care about. He was really just upset that I was on Fox News and that I, I was raising public awareness about what happened to me. He went on a tirade in the courtroom and said this had nothing to do with the Second Amendment. You had guns in New Jersey without a concealed carry permit. You're guilty. You're going to go to jail. You should take the plea deal. This is way before trial even began, and that was what I was up against. A, a judge who clearly already thought that I was guilty, wanted me to be guilty, and then when I went to trial and we talked about for two and a half days how there were exemptions to these laws, and I met these exemptions, he refused to let the jury know what the exemptions were when they, when they went to deliberate. And did you have another lawyer when it came time for trial? I did. Thankfully, I... In August of 2009, I was on Freedom Watch with Judge Napolitano, and it must have been within 36 hours, Evan Knappen had reached out to me. and Yeah, stand-up guy. He was on the show after your conviction. I, Wow, it's it's uh, very difficult to hear this. I, it, 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 I want you to put yourself in Brian's shoes when you listen to this. Never been in trouble with the law. Now having to deal just with the lingo. They're wanting me to take a plea deal. I refuse to plead. Did you ever think you would find yourself in this situation ever in your entire life to that point? No, never. It just it never crossed my mind. The, the, big, the biggest obstacle in my life was finding an apartment in Hoboken. When you heard the judge telling you you were going to go to jail, did that strengthen your resolve to fight even harder? Or did you ever feel at some point, you know what, maybe I'd have just sucked this up? No, it, I always felt like it was worth fighting for. And, and the more and more tyrannical that they were, the prosecutor and the judge, the more that I thought I should just stand up for what's right, force them to bring the entire weight of their corruption down on me. And that will illustrate to the, to the public just how terrible this is. Absolutely brilliant statement. David, analyze that statement if you would. When well, we come back, okay, we've got we've got to take a break. But I want you to analyze that statement. That was amazing. The full weight of their corruption and the more tyrannical it became. Nothing short of that. Hey, what's up? This is Sean, a.k.a. Shanto, A-A-R Shanto. You can now check out my new website, which is IRFnews.com, IRFnews.com. There you can see all the stuff we do here in the studio. Also read some of my blogs, and I'm going to have news feeds and everything else you are interested in. So all you got to do is go to IRFnews.com. That's IRFnews.com. Oh, yeah, I think Mark's listening. Remember, IRFnews.com. All right, let's let's continue this story, uh, Brian. You're now in the system. Your resolve was strengthened, David. I asked you before the break, Brian. I think I, I think you you articulated the tyranny. I think you articulated the corruption brilliantly when you closed out the last break. So what I want to do is get David's opinion and then bring you back in to tell us exactly what happened, where you're at today, David. Your thoughts? Yeah. Well. What immediately comes to mind is from Ian Fleming's novel, Goldfinger, if you can believe it or not. And and he had this uh, saying where he said that uh, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is a conspiracy. And the cops wanted Brian to come back, and they said, do it the easy way or the hard way. Okay, he went the easy way, and they smacked him with a mallet. They wanted to search his trunk, do it the hard way or the easy way. He did it the easy way. They smacked him with a mallet. Now he's got the judge saying, do it the hard way or the easy way. At this point, you know what? Every time I do it the easy way, these people smack me with a mallet. Why should I do it the easy way? Brian, I'll leave it with that. Let's segue into that. Continue, please. It, it's, it's, it's funny that you say that because that's exactly how it felt. They're, they're telling me that they have my best interests in mind. And the judge even told me that Fox News and the media were trying to, to use me and they were going to manipulate me and they were, they were going to be the reason why I would wind up in prison. And, and as he's telling this to me from the bench, I, can't, I couldn't help but think, 
I don't believe a word that you're saying, and I feel like whenever I do what you guys tell me to do, I get closer and closer to prison. All right, well, let's go there. Uh, you were convicted. I was, and the, the jury came back from deliberations three times asking the judge what the exemptions to the law were, because we spent two and a half days in trial talking about the exemptions. And one of the ones, it, I mean, they were so specific. One of the ones, I'd like, I'd like to read it for the audience, that said, why did you make us aware at the start of the trial that the law allows a person to carry a weapon if the person is moving or going to a shooting range? And during the trial, both the defense and prosecution presented testimony as to whether or not the defendant was in the process of moving. And then in your charge for us to deliberate, we are not permitted to take into consideration whether or not we believe the defendant was moving. That was three the times, jury three times. That was one of the jury's questions. Wow. Because they were not allowed to consider the exemptions. And they came back three times and asked, how, hold on, how can we spend two and a half days talking about whether or not we think he's moving? And then when you tell us what to deliberate about, we're not allowed to consider this. All right, so it seems the jury was looking out for you here and trying to get you out of this as, as best they could. And it was the system that was stopping them cold. They absolutely were, and the judge kept on telling them, listen, I'm the, I'm the judge, I am the law, I have decided as a matter of law that you're not allowed to consider whether or not you think any exemptions apply. All you're allowed to do is consider whether or not he possessed. All right, based on that, they came back with the conviction. I, I want you to, to tell my audience, who is probably sitting here riveted, riveted like I am right now, and, and like Ed is here in the studio, and I know David is, what happened next? You were convicted. Tell us. I, I want the uh, the details. You, you they handcuffed you. They took you to prison. You had a seven year sentence. You were staring at. They did. Uh, and you know, for the first couple weeks, you do in county while they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with you. And that's one of the more dangerous places because it's a it's a temporary housing jail, and uh, people are really trying to prove themselves. So what you want to do in in county jail is lay as low as possible and, and just stay off the radar. From county, you go to a place called Craft, which is Central Reception. That's probably, if you can imagine, something worse than Shawshank. That's, that's what this place is. It's in, it's in Trenton. Uh, if it were a private building, it would have been condemned probably a few decades ago. But it's you know, for the undesirables. It's for convicted felons, so nobody really cares. Brian, you're with uh, a whole bunch of really nice people who were also transplanted from Colorado and uh, accidentally had some hollow point ammunition in their car, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not, not that I did. Not that I did. <laughs> All right. I don't want to make light of this. I, I can't. No, I'm not making light. No, I, just no, want to, I'm I want to make sure the audience hears, you know, for, for something, you know, possessing a firearm, something that is a fundamental human right. right, he's being thrown in with the worst that mankind and American society has to offer. So I just want to make sure that the audience yeah. hears that. Did Brian. you ever, ever think in your entire life that you would have to be learning prison lingo and how to survive in a box filled with the worst society can throw at you. Absolutely no. Uh, I mean, I, I I wasn't prepared for it. I adapted as quickly as I could, but it's. I mean, how do you, how does somebody adapt to that? Now you were you were in for four months. There was tremendous pressure politically put on Governor Christie. This show participated in that. I'm very proud to say that your attorney was on this show twice to talk about your case and to to, uh, to to open the doors for listeners, give the information on how they can get involved. Governor Christie eventually, I can't say he pardoned you, he commuted your sentence. He did. But, but your um, conviction still stands. Are you still right now a convicted felon? I am still a convicted felon. Wow. Okay. The process was, that, you're, that you're going through now. I was released from prison on December 21st, uh, 2010, and immediately filed for the appellate division to hear my case. And the appellate division overturned and remanded illegal possession of firearms. And the state decided not to pursue that, and so they dropped it. Uh, the appellate division overturned and dismissed the charge of illegal possession of high-capacity magazines. Uh, but they upheld the conviction of illegal hollow point ammunition. The technicality that they, that they did this on is because the exemptions for moving firearms say that you can move your firearms from the place of purchase to your house, from your house to another house, 
from your house to a shooting range, or from your house to go hunting. Hollow point ammunition has all of the same exemptions, except it doesn't specifically say that you can take your hollow point ammunition from one house to another when moving. Seven years in prison. You're, you're four months into it. What was life like for you? At, at first, it was pretty slow, but eventually uh, my girlfriend had, had put up uh, on Amazon uh, a list of books that I really wanted to read. So I managed to read 42 books when I was in prison. And uh, in prison, there's a thing called 23 and 1 that, that I was subject to. I don't know if it's standard, but it essentially means that you spend, outside of meals, you spend 23 hours a day in your cell, and you get to leave your cell and go outside for one hour a day. Now, why, why were you subjected to that? That sounds like segregation. Was it protective custody of some sort? Um, no, it's uh, I, I, I believe it's different for people who are in minimum security because of what these charges were, I was not considered a minimum security person. I was considered... You're in the I more mean, serious uh, crime category here. They've got to really clamp down on you. Is that it? Exactly. So when Corazine passed the Graves Act, uh, or amended the Graves Act back in 2008, she turned the illegal possession of a firearm from a fourth-degree felony into a second-degree felony, which is very similar. It's making it akin to the use of a firearm in the commission of in the commission of a crime. Uh, so that essentially made me a violent criminal. Did you feel safer being in 23-hour lockdown at all? No, not really. I mean, it's, it, it's you know, it's just different shades of gray. Then, right, I guess, yeah. It's, I, I, I can't even imagine. I, I, I can't even imagine. David Codry, it makes me sick to my stomach what I'm hearing. Yeah, and to, again, to subject a person who's all his life been law-abiding, and who did his best to be cooperative and was trying to do the right thing when all of this came down on him. It's just amazing, Mark. What an amazing story. Yeah, it really is. Now, okay, fast forward now. The governor commuted your sentence. You were released. Thank God. Uh, you've still got the felony to work with, but at least you're out of prison. And, and I feel confident that by bringing, the, uh, you know, bringing truth and justice to this, that you will eventually prevail. I don't have any doubt in there, and I know you have to. You have a lot to go through to get there. But let's talk briefly about the fact that you, through this whole process, now you have not seen your son in four years. That's exactly what I was getting to. Um, so when Corzine changed that law and made simple possession of a lawfully owned firearm without a concealed carry permit, even if it's in, like, you know, transportation, it doesn't matter if a corrupt judge was involved. She turned that into a second-degree felony and made that similar to a violent crime. Possession of the gun itself is the violent crime. And the family court judge interpreted that to mean that I was a violent gun owner and that any parent who owned guns was by nature a violent parent. And he used that as the rational basis to restrict my custody to my child. You are now fighting the what? The third charge, obviously, and you're willing to take this all the way to the top as you should be. The New Jersey Supreme Court has decided after sitting on it for 16 months that they're not going to hear my case. Uh, so I started a project on Indiegogo. You can visit it at www.bandbykickstarter.com. And I've already raised enough funds to take my case, or at least to petition SCOTUS to hear my case. But the rest of the money that I'm trying to raise is to get custody of my son back by Christmas. How much money do you need? $40,000 total, and I'm about halfway there. All right, you're halfway there. The site, again, where people, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this and you want to help this young man, what's the site again, Brian? It's bannedbykickstarter.com. Bannedbykickstarter.com? Is there anything that, that uh, listeners need to see when they get to that site? Do they need to click anywhere? Can you direct them? Uh, yeah, as soon as, as soon as you get there, it, it'll take you to my Indiegogo page, and I'm not asking something for nothing. Uh, I've, I've written a book, and I'm offering ebook for eight dollars and hardcover copies for thirty two. And then, if you want to give more, you're you're certainly allowed to do that. And you have obviously the book and the undying gratitude of myself and my entire family. You you can't walk into a legal battle unless you are fully prepared to go all the way. And I don't expect that this is going to be easy, and I know that I, I can't even file the first motion unless I'm ready to go all the way. Okay. All right. Banned by Kickstarter.com. David, you want to jump in here? A plea for help is, is all I can ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is a plea for help for this young man. 
Yeah, I, I wrote up a column today on davidcodry.com. I'd encourage everybody to go read it, and then that links over to Brian's site. The other thing I'd like to say about this, Mark, is that uh, it just raises my hackles every time I hear someone from the pro-gun side say, enforce existing gun laws. That's what they were doing to Brian Aiken. Well, that's okay. what's so vital. When I, That's why I mentioned, David, Colorado residents in particular, Maryland residents in particular, Connecticut residents, New York residents. Elections have consequences, ladies and gentlemen. This young man was convicted on laws that are now on your books. This can happen to you. Take action. Help this young man. You might be helping yourself down the road. This is what happens when we allow this to get out of control. The SAFE Act. Are you kidding me? These are the people that these laws ensnare and entrap. Oh, man. This just illustrates we're listening to him talk about prison and what it's like to be let off and stuck in a concrete box for 23 hours a day. So when, when you're hearing two sides of this debate and people talking about things, and you've heard the phrase, reasonable, common sense, gun control. And uh, we're going to have a, a disagreement over this and talk about it. Well, why is it that the disagreement, if they win, ends up with me or, or Brian in a concrete box? Uh, if I disagree, it's like, well, you're free to not have a firearm, not have a standard capacity magazine if you want to. But if I want to possess these means of self-defense for me and my family and they have their way, it means being in a concrete box. Yes, yeah, it's absolutely. It's absolutely sickening, ladies and gentlemen. This is what gun control does. This is who gun control snares. Good, law-abiding people. It, it, it ought to hit home because it could happen to any of us, really. Uh, his mother must be is absolutely beside herself. Uh, year, all these years later, I remember having this conversation with his attorney. And she was devastated at the time. Sure. And if you can imagine wanting to help your son or daughter, if you, many of you are parents, and having this happen to your son or daughter, what do you call this? Overzealous policing, David, or do you call it utter, downright, filthy corruption? Yeah, I call it tyranny. Ed Stone, your thoughts? I'd have to say that it can happen to any of you. Um, we talked about the reciprocity issue earlier. Any of us could be visiting a place like New Jersey. There have been more than one uh, instance of somebody flying into New Jersey, their flight getting diverted, picking up their luggage and heading to the hotel and, and getting arrested and going through exactly what Brian's going through. Yeah, it is absolutely downright frightening.